Basically, what I'm going to be doing is uh, talking you through three things that are particularly important to me. So, zombies, beer, and Taylor Swift. And there is a reason for this. The reason for this is that there's a, a kind of prevalent discourse, specifically in media and society over the last five years or so, that has emphasized the value of higher education can only be read through things like maths or science or those kind of uh, subjects that lead directly to a job or enable you as graduates of a particular institution to demand or exact a certain salary from an employer. So I'm here tonight to say that is all rubbish. And actually what is more important is the opportunity for you to choose what you engage with, what you choose to study, and where that can actually lead you in terms of your career path. I'm going to start with a caveat as well. I'm not going to stand up here and talk about um, politics, the politics of HE or political policy. If you want to debate politics, we can do that at the bar afterwards. What I will say, though, is that what I'm going to talk about is inherently political. So um, I'll be talking about the kind of decisions people make to study at a place like BU, which is non-conventional, non-traditional in its approach to developing its curriculum. And for those of you that are new to BU, I will be sort of congratulating you, I think, if I'm allowed, on uh, committing a small yet very significant act of intellectual rebellion in choosing a place that uh, deviates from the norm, from tradition. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll see how quickly I do it. I promise I won't keep you for any longer than I have to. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the, the quote in my title, um, They Let You Study Anything Nowadays. This was um, said to me by a former colleague of mine a few years ago. I'd just finished my master's degree, and I was gearing up to do uh, my PhD. And we were talking, and he said, so, so what is it you're actually going to do? What does it actually involve? And I, I kind of explained to him how, over the course of the past year, I'd become interested in uh, this relationship between popular culture and nationalism, this, uh, the way in which these, these texts kind of support or give license to a certain kind of identity. And I explained how, in the first instance, what I was going to be doing was reading a lot of Ian Fleming's James Bond novels. James Bond, he turned around and looked at me, and I said, yeah, and I kind of started to explain what the process was about. He kind of went, Pff. They let you study anything nowadays, and then shook his head and wandered off. And at first, I was really embarrassed. I think I sat there and, and maybe kind of to uh, sort of stammer out some very English response of, oh, well, you know, I'm not clever enough to do anything else anyway, or, uh, you know, maybe it will get better. The kind of classic British self deprecation. And then, after thinking about it for a little bit longer, I, um, in the great tradition of these kind of stories, dear reader, uh, the more I thought about it, the angrier I became because I started to realize what it was. And in the first instance, all it is is snobbery. And then after realizing what it is, I started to realize what it did. And what it did was uh, reinforce this kind of discourse that I spoke about in my introduction. It privileges a kind of canonical view of the world. So the idea that um, those things of real value are those kind of great traditional texts of the British or the English or even the Western canon of literature. So for those of you who haven't uh, come across this term before, the canon, you've definitely encountered it. It's basically all those works of uh, visual arts or literature, uh, sculpture and so on, that are deemed by some sort of invisible establishment or committee to be the most important works ever. And to deviate from it, to study things which don't conform to this idea of the canon, is to do something lesser, do something less worthwhile, less worthy, less valuable, that is a waste of your time and a waste of your money. And in the opinions of my ex-colleague, not really work at all. And I mean, academics come in for a lot of stick, I think, when it comes to the kind of things they study, especially in the media. We're very much uh, familiar with ideas of the academic ivory tower, this is probably something you've all come across in uh, reading newspapers or uh, in the news. This idea that as academics, we kind of cloister ourselves away from the real world of work. And instead, what we do is sort of sit in our, our sort of very lush, gilded offices, thinking about things which have no relationship to the, the real world of work. Another phrase that's been doing the rounds for a few years now is Mickey Mouse degrees. 
Yeah, imagine most people have heard of those. Again, similar kind of idea. The, uh, the kind of subjects that stray away from traditional subjects, from, um, from traditional learning, rote learning, uh, absorbing information and then being able to produce statistics. Instead, looking at more interpretive ways of thinking and so on. Mickey Mouse degrees, or so the critics say, are the kind of things that are, again, a waste of your time, a waste of your money, and not worthwhile. And in many ways, I can see why these kind of things occur. They have a very long history. Um, Malcolm Bradbury, in a book called The History Man in uh, the mid-1970s, developed this caricature of an academic called Howard Kirk. Now, Howard Kirk was a lecturer in sociology at the fictional university of Watermouth, not based on Bournemouth, actually based on Brighton. Um, and he was this kind of real archetype of uh, the most over-earnest type of lecturer going. He wore very tight trousers, he wore leather jackets, he extolled the virtues and cultural significance of Coronation Street to anyone who would listen. Um, and what Bradbury was doing, I, I kind of understand it, what he was doing is what most good novelists do, which is hold up a kind of satirical mirror to the world around them and exaggerate with a bit of artistic license some of the more negative points they might see in culture or uh, society around them. But actually, what's happened in the last 40 years since that book is that subjects like sociology, like cultural studies, like English literature, have only diversified and sought to embrace these very different forms of culture, like Coronation Street, like James Bond, like video games, Taylor Swift, and beer. And employability, or how we define employability as a result of gaining higher education, is luckily a little bit more nuanced in places like this than the newspapers will have you believe. Employability is not just a straight line from A-levels through degree into a job, through a salary, through progression and into retirement. Instead, the value of doing these kind of degrees, even those labelled Mickey Mouse degrees, is in interpretation. It's in identifying emergent social trends, phenomena that exist around us in popular culture and the media, um, interpreting them, analysing them, and then deriving conclusions from that analysis. It makes the people that study those courses far more adaptable than the newspapers will make you think. And that is what employers will be looking for. And this is why popular culture is important. We need to engage with these topics in order to make sure our skills in these uh, different kind of disciplines are sharp. And this does lead me to my first point. So let's take the figure of the zombie. I imagine everyone here has encountered or um, consumed some sort of zombie uh, fiction before. I would actually probably put good money on the fact that more people here have uh, read a zombie novel or watched a zombie film or engaged with zombie media than have ever read uh, a Dickens novel cover to cover out of their own choice. And we now have reached a point where there are so many uh, and so sort of such a wide uh, variety of zombie media that there's something for everyone. So we go from films, there are romantic comedies such as Warm Bodies through to thrillers like World War Z. Um, very popular TV shows, such as The Walking Dead, which came out of comics media. Um, also In the Flesh, a very uh, little-known BBC Three series from a couple of years ago, which really deserved a much better audience than it got. Um, through to video games. So, um, very popular titles like The Last of Us, Day Z, um, Plants vs. Zombies, and the sort of fiendishly addictive uh, Call of Duty Nazi Zombies modes, which I put in a lot of research and homework in before giving this talk. Um, and what this kind of tells us, or what this allows me to do, is make a kind of twofold point. Firstly, one about its popularity. As I said, these things are hugely popular. Um, popularity is a significant indication of something we should be engaging with as academics. What innovate or what sort of grabs hold and energizes culture around us? It's our job as academics to engage with these things, to work out what is, uh, what is popular and why it is popular. Not to do so is again a form of snobbery. Secondly, it's the implications that this popularity has. So with the zombie, uh, the zombie genre, we can start to examine not just how this is a development in a, in a certain form of entertainment, in this instance, uh, the horror genre, 
But actually, what we can start to see is how different writers, different filmmakers, different game makers use the zombie as a lens through which to read contemporary culture. So the zombie starts to stand in for various fears and anxieties that kind of gnaw away at our culture from the inside. If we take The Last of Us as an example, this deals with uh, the fear of a global pandemic, which in the last couple of years, especially around the Ebola crisis in West Africa, became sort of startlingly prescient and very, very current. Elsewhere, something like In the Flesh dealt with uh, LGBT issues in small communities. Um, the writers of that show used the zombie as uh, a figure of the other that some people would fear whereas some people would be sympathetic towards to explore these kind of issues and bring them out uh, into the open. And what this does, and what popular culture does in this instance, is form a very safe space for people to start to unpick these things. We can deal with very difficult issues. We can deal with very scary issues, terrorism, overpopulation, um, the death of the planet, the breakdown of society. But we do so in nice, safe fictional boxes. We allow these things that scare us out of that box for a brief while and then we put them back in. So it, it really goes to show that how, um, how an innocuous, seemingly innocuous cultural product can actually be far more important and far deeper on a second look. And this brings me to my, my next point and that of beer. And you're probably sitting there thinking, beer's beer, right? What's he gonna say about beer to make me think differently? But actually beer has a very long history. Um, people have been drinking beer for thousands of years. For a long time, I think in this country in the 20th century, people thought of beer as just, you know, just something you did. It was something you certainly, kind of a ritual you perform as a man. You would go drinking Friday nights, um, typically to get out of the house during the 1950s and 60s. Most men would use the pub as an escape from domesticity. And for a long time, beer was kind of just beer. But then in the 1960s and 1970s, we imported this mysterious, mystical thing called lager from the continent which changed the way British people engaged with drinking. So suddenly, drinking beer was not about this escape from the family home. Instead, it became about uh, showing off your taste, showing off your knowledge, showing off your, uh, your cultural uh, awareness of what was in vogue. And we still have a kind of situation where that's true today. So, I mean, if we think about the, the sort of social landscape of beer, we have two factions. We have the big bearded blokes of camera on one side, and then we have the mustachioed, tight trousered hipsters on the other. And you and I, ladies and gentlemen, are somewhere in the no man's land of the bar between them, as they kind of vie for control of the pumps and the pints that are available. And still we have the same situation. If you go up to Dylan's bar um, and you order something like Something like this, which is an American IPA, which is actually a very new import to Dylan's, only in the last 18 months or so. It apparently says something. It says something about what you know, what your tastes are, and it allows you to uh, sort of display a sense of awareness on a very local level. But beer also lets us think about things on a very national level as well. Something that um, you will notice in big sort of beer producing cities, somewhere like Bristol, for instance, which has a great microbrewery culture, is that many of these new breweries will use the imagery and the iconography of the British Empire in selling their beers. So most places will do an IPA, which is what I have here. IPA stands for Indian Pale Ale. So basically the legend goes, this was a beer developed for export to India in the early 19th century because conditions weren't right for brewing in India. It was too hot, they didn't have the refrigeration techniques, so they had to ship it out from England. And as a result, many of these modern brews will use this kind of iconography on their bottles. So there'll be pictures of elephants, there'll be pictures of, ex of explorers, uh, sort of various Victorian bewhiskered gentlemen uh, selling you these beers. And on one hand, we kind of, we accept this. It's a regular kind of marketing tool. It's something we, uh, we recognize. But for all this kind of uh, very safe, very fuzzy, nostalgic look at empire, it kind of glosses over the fact that for millions of people, their experience of empire was that of a dehumanizing, brutalizing regime that sought to squeeze out as much profit from its colonies as it possibly could. So to use these kind of uh, images in a sense of costume drama sort of a way, um, costume drama is something we all love in this country, look at the success of Downton Abbey, is to 
yeah, is to smooth over these kind of uncomfortable truths about our national history. So it turns out you can see quite a lot through the bottom of a beer glass if you look hard enough. And this then leads me on to uh, my last topic. I saved Taylor Swift for last, obviously. Four years ago, who was Taylor Swift? Did anyone really know who Taylor Swift was? She was a country music star who'd maybe made some brief forays into pop, um, building up a profile, not really um, much going on. And then from 2012, the release of her album Red until the present, her rise into superstardom has been practically meteoric. Yeah? So whether you are the most ardent Swifty or one of the haters, you know exactly who she is. And why is she important? Well, she's important for myriad reasons, and I'm going to just give you a few. Um, Taylor Swift is responsible for a new direction in event-driven pop music. So what I mean by this is that you get a tradition, certainly within singer-songwriter genres, going back to people like Bob Dylan and so on, where they tend to try and separate out a public persona um, and a, a sort of sense of musicianship. So where the indie bands, which are obviously much cooler than Taylor Swift, as she herself acknowledges, would only talk about their music and would not want to talk about the kind of showbiz drama that surrounds them, Swift combines these. So what contemporary scholars in uh, what I'm calling Swift studies have started to do is examine how uh, she seamlessly blends these things together so that the music, this main text, is no longer the central focus. It becomes one of many different texts in an overall kind of seamless web of entertainment, whether it's her personal life, whether it's her very public breakups, or whether it's the music she creates out of it. And we can see this in a few of her, um, well, it depends how you view her. We can either see them as popularity stunts, or we can see them as genuine indications of how she cares or how she makes an effort to engage with her fan base. Now, we're probably all aware of a situation earlier this year where she donated uh, a large chunk of money to one of her fans to pay off a student loan. Yes, yeah, so on the surface, this is great. This is an indication of an artist engaging with her fan base through social media, for instance, um, taking a concern or taking an interest in their life and then helping them out directly. But of course, the amount of money she gave this fan to pay off her student loan was $1,989. Yeah, there's a very nice marketing trick there, all for the cost of 2,000 quid. Her PR team must have been rubbing their hands together. Similarly, she gives a lot of money to African charities. On the one hand, this is a great thing, a star giving out some of her wealth in order to make other people's lives better. On the other hand, people criticize her and say what she's doing is assuaging her own sense of guilt for perpetuating a neo-colonialist vision of Africa in wildest dreams. If you've seen this video, I'd like to you know, entreat you to watch it again and count the number of black Africans that appear in that video. They are very few. So she's a very divisive figure, but regardless of what you feel about her, you cannot deny her importance. She raises some very interesting questions in terms of gender, and how gender works in the pop music industry. For instance, watch Blank Space and the kind of exaggerated, jealous uh, sort of meltdown she has in that video and how she satirizes that. Or feminism. She is a very different kind of feminist to someone like Miley Cyrus. Yeah, she shies away from a more kind of aggressive sexuality that Miley uses for one which is about um, business and control, control over her image, control over her career. All these kind of traits that are generally associated with men and not women. She also works in artist corporate relations. So we think about her very public battles with Spotify or Apple and how she supposedly stands up for the little guy, the artist, whilst being one of the biggest selling artists on the planet. And of course, she makes uh, interesting questions or raises interesting questions to do with race, especially with her interactions with uh, Kanye and also Nicki Minaj at very, uh, various awards ceremonies over the past couple of years. Plus, she loves cats, which instantly makes her appealing to at least 50% of the population and me. Um, so what's the point in all this? There is a point in all this. The point in all of this is that value um, is not found in revenue. It is not found in your salary. 
It is not found in the amount of students who come through the door to study a particular degree. What I've been talking about in relation to all these different topics is the, the value in sharpening your analytical skills by looking at things which exist in the world around us. So we live in an information age. We are constantly told we are living in this information age where we read thousands of words per day, either on social media, through advertising, um, through newspapers, or many other sources. And there's that statistic that does the rounds about how every day uh, human beings take more pictures than all of the humans in history before them, a process that is only sort of growing and growing and growing. So what to do with all this information? How are we able to separate the ephemeral and the useful? Through skills, you will learn doing these supposedly Mickey Mouse degrees. Analyzing, interpreting, uh, evaluating, weighing up information, and then making a decision. And these are the kind of skills that employers will value. These are the kind of reasons that we need to keep studying these topics. It's worth me finishing just by saying that um, Going right back to the start of what I said about the ivory tower and how university is described as a privilege. It is a privilege. Do not be mistaken. It is a privilege to be here. It's an expensive one that you are all paying for. So whilst you are here, make the most of it. Yeah, you are students. You will have to study things you hate. You will have to read books that you can't stand. But you have the power to change the conversation. You have the power to direct where you study, where you put your energies, and what you do whilst you're here. So use it. Whilst you will have to uh, do some of this work, you have the power to make it different in the future. And cherish that freedom. That's what I'll end on as my optimistic uh, little message. Cherish the freedom you have to decide where you wish to take your education. Yeah? Fight for that freedom. Stick up for it. And if you encounter any haters along the way, well, you know what to do, right? Thank you. <laughs>